All right, we're just out of time, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, everybody in the right place, I hope. All right, so um, if you were unable to make it to discussion or need a reminder, um, the setup for Jupiter and that stuff is there's a, like a lecture note on uh, the resources tab that has a PDF description. Um, and I'm going to turn this on and try not to blow all you guys out with my very loud voice, um, but maybe we'll get better voice on the recording. Uh, so the thing that we ask you to do is before each class starts, before each lecture starts, if you can start up a Jupyter Notebook, and if you haven't done it today, that's okay, but maybe you could do it right now. Um, but start up a Jupyter Notebook, and then in the... Just realize I don't have this tab open. But so in the materials uh, directory, like the homework, there is now a lectures directory. And then the lectures are brilliantly named after what number lecture we are on. Uh, so generally just choose the highest number, but copy that over into your student folder. And then you can follow along with the class as well. Anybody have any questions? Does this make sense? All right, so starting on Thursday, though, please make sure you have done this before class starts so that you can set it up. Um, the lecture is usually there kind of towards the beginning of the day on the lecture day. Uh, worst case, you can copy it over, uh, you know, kind of right as class starts. Um, but the Jupyter Notebook launch sometimes takes a minute, particularly if you're all doing it at once. Uh, so you know, if you can do it before class starts, uh, you'll have an easier time of it. So that's what it should look like. Um, but yeah, and copy it over and then you can edit your own version. All right, questions, make sense to everyone? All right, uh, did everyone manage to get homework in or, or have already talked to us about some problem with getting the homework in? Because I think the homework was due right before this class. All right. Uh, if you haven't or you're having any trouble with Jupyter Notebook, please see us after class so we can get that sorted out. Uh, the last thing we want you to do is be gated because of some stupid tool problem. Um, you know, I will reiterate that there is a it is it does not perform well on the guest uh, Wi-Fi. So make sure you connect to the BU Wi-Fi uh, in order to use it. Uh, I think that's it for announcements. So let's continue on our merry way. Assuming I can figure out how to change slides. All right. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Where should we select our working directory? So I always use my home directory. So like your student, uh, like the student directory. Well, actually, my home directory. Um, not my student or the equivalent of my student directory. I choose the my home directory because then I can move around within it. But you can always use, you showed them the files app, right? The files interface. I showed them how to like, go and the So you can always go here too and go to Project DS100 um, and copy files from here. So if you, if you launched in the wrong place or you're not seeing it or whatever, just go back to this, the SEC main page again, where you launched the notebook from. You can also just copy files here. Um, if you're a Linux expert, you can also log in and using SSH and move it around manually. But uh, I assume most of you are not. So, so you can also do it from this interface. You would just go into materials in this directory, in this DS100 directory, lectures, and then copy. The copy is a little weird in that the button's up here, um, but it works as long as you read. Yeah. You, co you copy it from the materials folder to your student folder. <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you. When you copy it over, it doesn't let you select it? Yeah, you have to open it in the notebook. Or in, in Jupyter Notebook, like basically it doesn't know what to do with that file. And it should just be there. Yeah, yeah. 
it's the same directory structure. All right. So hopefully you figured it out. If uh, if not, you know, uh, definitely see us in office hours or um, you know give it a try when you're not under the gun, uh, and it should be easy enough. Uh, I think it's really hard to use like a web-based UI to like manipulate files. So I totally appreciate it. Um, it is a little confusing, but you'll get the hang of it, and it gets it's pretty easy once you kind of get the hang of it. All right, so uh, last time we talked about tables. Um, and so basically this lecture, um, everything we talk about in this lecture, you will be using for the course of the semester. So if you don't understand something, this is a good time to ask. Um, on the flip side, uh, if you don't instantly memorize things, that's probably okay because uh, you will literally be using it every five minutes uh, when you're going through the rest of the course. So it should, it should become rote memory pretty fast. So uh, the first thing I like to cover, though, is to kind of reiterate, uh, so both that these functions are available on tables, but also from kind of a programming perspective, uh, this slang is pretty consistent across, or jargon, I guess, it's not really slang, jargon, across kind of the whole programming world. So these terms generally mean the same thing. Um, so you have select, which basically chooses a certain set of columns, okay, and then puts them into a new table, which you imagine might be useful. Drop um, is kind of the reverse. So it says, instead of selecting these three, remove these three, okay? And then sort is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, you want to sort by a particular column. You can also pass descending equals true, and that will make the sort uh, go in the reverse order. And then where is how you find an individual component. So if you, you know, going back to the ice cream example, you want to find only the ice creams that have uh, chocolate, right? So that's what you use the where for. The label is whatever the column is, okay? And then whatever it is you're looking for. And as we get further into the, the class, uh, those conditions can be quite a bit more sophisticated than just like a match of the same uh, word. Uh, but we'll talk about those as we get to them. Any questions? All right, hopefully y'all made it into Top Hat um, because I think there's a question coming up soon. I keep forgetting that I can't actually change slides from there. Oh, there's a question right now. All right, so which function constructs a new table in which the specified columns are omitted or removed? And hopefully you're all into Top Hat and Oh, I have to start the question. And there are some choices. My bag is positioned in such a way that I'm paranoid I'm going to trip over it. All right, getting pretty good numbers on that. Just remember the the question is asking you want to get rid of these columns, not get these columns. All right, we've got a few more coming in, but we'll, we'll give it the grace period because maybe people weren't in Top Hat yet. Um, I can never decide whether there's like, are there two people just like hanging out that don't actually exist? All right, let's keep going. Or not. And as you can see, most of you were correct. So, Drop was the correct answer. Select is the reverse, right? Um, omit doesn't exist. So that seems obvious, but it's not a real thing. Um, and then obviously sort and where are definitely not correct choices. All right. Uh, there's a lot of slides for here's the right answer as far as I'm concerned. All right, so now um, 
Hopefully you've noticed my awesome splash, uh, which indicates when I should switch to the Jupyter Notebook. Um, and assuming I can do that correctly. Here it is. Actually, let me just kill this so I don't make the same mistake again. Oh my goodness. All right, so first up, let's talk about numbers. Um, so does anybody know what kind of number we typically call this in programming, but we also call it this in math too? Uh, how about you back there? An integer, that's correct. All right, uh, so an integer, um, this is, when we get into the really basics of uh, the kind of programming world, I can't remember which words are regular English words and which words are programming words. So sometimes it takes me a minute. Um, so an integer is just any number, okay, positive or negative, that has no decimal place or it's the decimal place isn't written, right? So if you know anything about math, of course, there is a decimal here, right? It's just that it's zero, so we don't draw it, okay? Now, as you might imagine, because as I have said, and we'll say probably 50,000 times, um, in 95% of programming languages, we can't be bothered to write out the word integer because it's too many characters. So we just write int. Yeah. Oh, sure. Better, more? Did somebody say more? Yeah. Well, let's go crazy. Uh, that might be a little too much. All right, how's that? Good? All right, awesome. Um, they should just have me teach it from the back of the class and then I'd be able to tell how big it was. <laughs> but so moving on, uh, now I need to adjust my cheat sheet though. Okay, so two things I wanna point out there. So I now have this integer that's a 20, right? Okay, but we're just gonna call it an int. Why didn't this error? Does anybody have any ideas? because it's a comment. So when you're doing any kind of programming, it is generally a good idea to tell yourself or somebody else in the future what you were doing, okay? And so what we do to do that is we use what are called comments, okay? And they're exactly what they sound like. The way you indicate a comment is by putting what is, what's, what's the most popular term for this now? Hashtag maybe? It used to be called a pound sign. Before that it was called an octothorpe, um, but, which, and if, you, if you've never heard Octothorpe, you should go look up what it means because it's hilarious. Um, but that is uh, what we use to indicate that it's a comment. So that means that the programming language or whatever should ignore it from here. Not all languages use the same one, but in Python, that's how we indicate a comment. And just so you're aware, right? It means everything after this is a comment. So if I put this pound sign up here, okay? It would ignore the 22 and it wouldn't do anything. Um, but I put it here and it indicates that everything after it is just a comment. So we can, so the, uh, the language can safely ignore it. All right, so if I do 20 divided by three, is that a slash? No, I don't think, I can't tell what that is. Um, now this is not an integer. So what do you think we call that? I may know. All right, how about back there? A float, that's correct. So we call this a float and it's just spelled float. And depending on your math classes that may have come up in math, um, but it just means that there is a written and worthwhile part that is a decimal, okay? So anybody have a theory as to why we have two distinct um, things like a float versus an int, what, why would we want to have those separated? Yeah. Right, so basically, if we don't care about that part of the information, we can throw it away and therefore have much bigger integers, right? Because a computer at the end of the day has a limited amount of space. How many here uh, can't install any apps anymore on their phone because they're out of space? Right, uh, this is a daily complaint from my youngest son. 
I, I don't understand how he has managed to fill it up, but he has. So as you know, computers are limited for the amount of space they can hold. Uh, that's actually disk space, but we're also talking about RAM space, kind of irrelevant. Point is an integer can throw away the part to the right of the decimal and therefore get bigger sizes. Um, so generally speaking, it's the size uh, of the thing or the, like the holder for that number. And so that's why we don't just use floats all the time. It also is so that you can kind of, well, we'll get to that eventually. Um, all right, so here's the next question, which is, oops. Now, what kind of number is this one? Is that a float or an int? A float, right? Because it is carrying the, the decimal and the zero afterwards. We could turn it into an integer, but because we did division to get to it, we end up with a float, okay? All right. This is the one that always uh, tricks me. Let's say I want to raise this number to the power of five. Uh, does anybody know how you might raise it to the power of five? Uh, let's try. Let's try you back there. I haven't heard from you yet in the purple shirt. Two stars. That's correct. Um, this one always throws me because when you're doing it in math, you, if anybody remembers right, use a carrot or what's sometimes referred to as a hat. Um, and uh, in a very small number of programming languages, including the one I learned on, uh, it, they use a carrot. So uh, it's, uh, I find it particularly confusing. Um, but so that's how you raise something to a power. Um, and we can do kind of ridiculously large things as well as small things. Um, and as you can see, then we get a really big number when we try to raise a big number to a really big number. And that's a pretty big number. Um, one thing I point out here, although you shouldn't have to worry about it for the course of this class, but it's something to be kind of aware of, is there is a maximum size that a number can be, okay? And this is where, has anybody ever heard of their computer being 64-bit? Does that ring any bells? Okay, that's because... If you remember from the first class, you get 64 bits to store any given thing, okay? So a bit is just a little tiny zero or one, right? So if you talk about it in base two, the number of bits is the number of zeros and ones you can store in base two versus the old days when I started using computer, for example, 32-bit, uh, which obviously had much smaller numbers. And then before that was 16-bit, and even before that was 8-bit. Have you ever heard of 8-bit graphics, right? And they're really uh, like chunky or whatever. That's because you can't store that much information in 8 bits. So you end up with graphics that are kind of clunky looking, right? And nowadays we use, actually, I think like the PS5, I think is actually 128-bit, okay? So they can store much bigger numbers. So therefore they can do much bigger thing or much nicer looking like graphics, for example. So the reason I mention it is because you may run into some really big numbers where your precision starts to fall off because it can't store the number in that biggest space. All right, so we can also go and do, you know, because this is not like, you know, you've already learned all your arithmetic, right? So we're not, we're not you know, easing into things like ratios and decimals and that kind of stuff. But so you can just divide and, you know, kind of any numbers that you want and you will get, you know, the appropriate result, okay? So you get, you know, four divided by 700, and you're going to get a float that's 0.06 or 006-ish. And so we can get into bigger and bigger numbers. Um, but the next thing I like to ask is, uh, who remembers scientific notation? All right, can anybody explain scientific notation? Like what you use it for? Yeah. Right. So basically you use it for really big numbers and really small numbers because, you know, and this sounds like a programmer, but a mathematician is really who came up with it, right? Uh, 
people are lazy and you don't want to write all those digits out. So if you can get away with it, what you do is actually uh, kind of collapse some of the digits uh, so that you can um, you know, write them more easily, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, so for example, Python is actually going to do that quote unquote for us if we do something like this, where what happens is this little E, okay, indicates scientific notation and that there's 18 missing decimal places. Okay, so in front of that five, there's going to be 18 zeros. And the decimal moved over, sorry. Does that make sense? All right, cool. And then we can also kind of do, this is um, where we can get to, actually, let me show you one more example of where precision does start to hurt you. So we try to do this subtraction and we get zero. Now, if you look at this, right, you can tell just by the length of them that it shouldn't be zero, right? It's near zero, but it's not actually zero. So again, for the kind of math or whatever you're gonna do in this class, you, sh you shouldn't get anything like this. If you do, you probably have a bug, um, but it does happen. And so you kind of need to know that if you get a weird result, especially when you're doing anything with numbers, that it's possible that you have hit the precision window, like you've gone outside the precision window. And for the sake of this class, we're not really gonna cover how you can go about fixing that. You can fix it um, by basically using various tricks to deal with big numbers. Um, but when it's, uh, you know, when you're just using the built-in stuff, it doesn't work very well when you get really big or really small stuff. Basically anything it, as it gets, the more numbers that are in there, it doesn't really matter if it's a big number or a small number, the precision starts to deteriorate if it gets really, really big. So, but we can also do things like when we want to do powers, right? So does anybody know what, what this is doing? And I mean, I gave you the answer, so maybe it's easy to figure out, go ahead. You're doing the square root. So when you do a decimal over here, it's, it's the reverse, right, of squaring the number. And then obviously we can do an easier one. Oops, where we go 16 to the square, to basically the square root of 16, right? Which you all probably know is four uh, and that's easy. And then we talked a little bit about PEMBAS. PEMBAS, did I say that right? Like I said, that acronym didn't exist when I learned math. Um, I, I cannot remember what the one I did learn was though, but so we can also do, um, you know, whatever operations we want. Um, but what's interesting about this one is that going back to that precision problem again, you expect this just to be 10, right? But it's not because one of these precisions, probably this one, failed, right? So it didn't, it's not as precise as you would like. So one of the tricks we do um, around some of that is we uh, do what's called casting, okay? And so, let me see if I can get rid of this guy. So what we can do is if we actually tell it what type of thing we want it to be, then we'll get that result, which is great, right? So now we didn't get a 2.0, we got a two. So it's an int again, because I cast it using that method here that we'll talk about more in a minute, but called int. But we can also do kind of the opposite like, let's say we want to force it to have decimals, oops. We can put an integer in the float and get a 
All right, and then. Oh, one more thing I want to mention was with scientific notation is you can kind of do the reverse too, where where you can say the scientific notation. Um, you know, in this case, it's just going to show you the same scientific notation again, but it is valid to type in your own scientific notation using the E as the kind of operator that says this is scientific notation. All right, so we'll go back to the slides. And so this is just kind of a summary of what we just talked about. So a real number um, is the continuous quantity right along a, a number line. In Python, we call those floats. Um, but in uh, but we also have this concept of an integer, uh, which is I think is the same as a whole number. Um, but this is why I'm a programmer and not a mathematician. Um, so I think of them in terms of integers and floats uh, because that's what Python treats them as. Um, and then you know this is kind of the the it, how you would do it in math. Um, and then you know, but we have a little bit different a little bit different syntax when we do it in Python. All right. So uh, again, in summary, an int, an integer of any size, negative or positive. I think this is one of those things that I think catches people a lot. A lot of people assume kind of in the back of their head, right, that an int can only be positive, but that's not true. It can be positive or negative, um, and it never has a decimal point. Now, a float has an optional fractional part, so it might be 0 0.0, right, but it might also be point something, but it always has a decimal point with something after it. A float may use scientific notation, but an integer won't. Um, and they have limited size, but the limit is huge. You know, I showed you some examples, but as you can tell, right, those numbers, they're, they're pretty big and pretty small. Um, and usually the rule of thumb, this is where it gets a little weird, is that, it, you know, it's like 15 or 16 decimal places. Now, why do I say ish? Any ideas? Okay, this goes back to the computer being base two and us using base 10, because you can be very precise about the number of decimal places if you're talking about base two, but for in base 10, which is what we use, right, 15, 16, it's somewhere in 15 and 16 is what the actual binary number is of places it can be. So that's why I say ish, right, which is kind of a funny thing to say, because normally this is the kind of thing that'd be very precise, and it is, just not in the number system we normally use. Um, and to this point, right, is that that outside end, as you know, the example with the uh, 10, uh, uh, the square root of 10, then, uh, you know, raised to the second power, um, that last decimal place, I was wrong, right? So it's kind of like something to keep in mind, usually doesn't hurt you too badly. But if you really need very accurate precision at, you know, with high numbers and low numbers, you should be aware of it. And in the data science world, it's much more prevalent, right? Because you're dealing with numbers all the time than it probably is in general software programming. Um, but so that's some cautions there. All right, but we have another question for you. I'm not in love with this uh, 18 buttons to uh, actually get it to go. All right, so let's start this question. Wait, did it, did it show the actual question somewhere? Well, then they must be right. Oh yeah, you might be right. No, yeah, this is just the top hat logo. Um, well, it'll be very funny to see how many of you are correct. You don't see it on your screen either, do you? Oh, you do. Oh, okay. So what does it say on your screen? Oh, okay. What will float always have? It should be on your screen if you're looking at the top hat. 
Oh, it is up there. It's just in very, very tiny letters. All right, well, so learn something new every day. I told you we're new to Top Hat, so. And they really want to have a sales call with me, so I'll have plenty of things to talk to them about. All right, everybody got an answer in? All right, let's move on. So <clears throat> this one, I would just clarify, right? It's a decimal point or a decimal point, right? Don't say a decimal because it really is, it's about the period, okay? Or if you're European, the comma. Um, not so much the fact that there's a number on the right side. Okay, so there will always be a period. <clears throat> um, and so it's just like, that, that's the right answer to this question. Um, it's kind of a stupid answer, okay? Like, I wouldn't worry about it too much, but the point being is that it really is talking about the decimal point. All right. So let's talk about strings. All right, who here has seen The Mandalorian? All right, who here has heard of Baby Yoda? All right, so uh, my, my examples are mostly Baby Yoda related. So here you go. Um, All right, so this is a string, okay? And as I mentioned in some lecture prior to now, it's any characters, if there are any letters or punctuation or numbers or whatever you want, but you indicate it by quote marks, okay? And for the sake of this class, uh, the type of quote marks are kind of irrelevant, okay? As long as they match. So you can have, <clears throat> Uh, quotes with like two dashes or single, which looks like an apostrophe. And as long as they match on either side, it doesn't matter which one you use. The biggest use for them commonly, well, we'll get to that in a second. Um, but the, oops, is when we want to do something like Okay, so let me actually just show you this one and then this one. All right, so the most common use, right, is because you wanna use one of them inside. And so it's easier just to use the other one on the outside. That makes sense. So in this case, right, I use double quotes on the outside so that I could use an actual apostrophe on the inside, inside the string, okay? But here I didn't, I used single quote or apostrophe on the outside and then tried to use it in the middle and it got angry at me because I can't make a string that way. I mean, I did, I made a string here, but this part, it didn't know what to do with. Does that make sense? So that's the most common usage. Um, however, you can get away with it when, let's say there's a scenario where you want both, right? So you would say, um, baby Yoda says, they aren't Yoda, oops. All right, let's say, how about, I ain't Yoda. All right, so now I have a problem, right? Um, where 
I want to kind of use both in the middle. So what I can do is what's called escaping. Okay. And so what I do is I put a slash in front of it, which indicates don't treat this like the ending character, but instead just treat it as a regular character. Okay. Usually referred to as an escape or escaping. And if you notice, so now this quote here is fine because I'm using the double quotes on the outside, but I have a little bit of problem here because I actually want an escaped one, but then I want an actual, the quote to end the string as well. So, shoot, I just realized I'm gonna run out of power. Uh, it has been that kind of day. Actually, we'll take this half second. Graham, are you in the Zoom? Can you just check the sound? Any chance? Um, okay. So. Remember how I said it was that kind of day? Okay, that should be better. Apparently the wall socket's not charging because, you know. Um, okay, so. Oh, it's in the invite. Um, okay, so moving on. Let's say we didn't want to mess with that or whatever. So we want to say, baby, actually, let me use single quotes and spell baby correctly. Oh my goodness. All right, and then what we can do is we can actually add these strings together. Okay, so I made two strings and I put a plus sign between them and now I'll get what you might expect, except I don't have a, an apostrophe, but um, what I meant to do. Okay, good. So now I got my apostrophe because I just used double quotes around it over here. Um, and one thing I'll just point out is uh, Jupyter Notebook helpfully puts in quotes and double quotes and all that stuff when you type one, but keep in mind it does it a little aggressively sometimes. So. Sometimes that's the challenge. Um, but then you can also do, and this is referred to as a concatenation, okay, or adding the two strings together. Um, but you can kind of do as many as you want by just kind of saying, you know, whatever characters you want to put in there. Right? So you can kind of just keep going, add infinitum. Um, but here's where it starts to get a little bit interesting. Oops, entirely the wrong button. So if I do this times 10, any idea what that's gonna do? Um, hold back there again. Right, so it's gonna do, it's as if, right? Just like multiplication is, it's going to add that string to itself the number of times that you asked it to do it. But then you can get into 
really weird stuff. So what do we think is gonna happen if we do, any ideas? Yeah, why? Right, so I mean, theoretically, it could try to figure out what half of the string is, right, and put it on there another time, but what does that mean? You know, what if there's five characters, you know? So Python just says, nope, that's not a good idea. All right, don't do that. Um, and then the one thing I'll also show, out, I'll show you is when we were talking about the casting before, we can also do it with strings if they look like the number that we want it to be. So as you might imagine, if I can ever get my friends right, that just converts that number, that, uh, you know, that character into the number representation of it. Um, we can do the same thing with a float and we can do the easy one first, right? We can say 3.2 um, and that's great. Or we can also do float 3. Point, actually, let's just say three, which will give us a 3.0, just like it was doing with the numbers before. So, um, and then lastly, we can also kind of go in reverse and we can cast, but as you might imagine, because programmers are lazy, it's just str rather than writing out string um, and that just converts it back to a string. Okay. Cool. All right. So just to summarize, String, oh, this is another thing is uh, we'll, I'll probably use the terms text and string relatively interchangeably. They mean the same thing. Um, text is actually a little bit more generic, whereas string means I really mean like a string, a set of characters, but it's made up of a set of characters. And again, with the laziness, we usually call that C-H-A-R, but weirdly we pronounce that normally char, not car. Okay, even though character, right, it should be car, normally you say char. And a string is a set of characters of any length. Um, it can be, it can have spaces in it, it can have punctuation, it doesn't really make any difference. Um, the only thing is that apostrophe versus quotes thing. Um, a string consisting of numbers can be converted to a number, so you can turn this, you know, 12 into an actual 12, um, and you can convert pretty much anything to a string, okay? which is super handy when you're trying to figure out why something is broken. All right. So let's try another one. So this one's matching. So can't remember how it looks for you, but I think you kind of like match up one to, you know, C or whatever. All right, we're missing 10 people. Let's go. Oh, no, we're caught up. All right, cool. I'm moving on. All right, so this is how you all did. And then I think this is supposed to be the right answer, um, which is that that's a float, that's an integer, and that's a string. And then if we move on, we get to types. All right, so I'm sorry it's a little dry, but um, you know I try to I try to dance and stuff as much as possible. Um, 
So <clears throat> everything in Python has what's called a type, okay? And we've been kind of using the terms, uh, you know, quite a bit already, right? Int, stir, float, those are all types. But so what we can do is if we aren't sure of the type of something, we can ask Python, okay? And so we just pass in whatever the thing is to a method called type, and we get int in this case, right? But it also works on named things. So if you're not sure what's in it, you can set it, right? And then you can call type on the name, and we also get int. So now we know that in A is an int. But then we get it for, you know, kind of everything else as well. Um, so we can do, you know, type on 4.5 and we'll get a float. But to be clear, we won't, it doesn't do any conversion. So if it's 4.5 as a string, it's going to tell you it's a string. All right. So this can be handy when you're, uh, you know, trying to do, if you're trying to do math with it, for example, and you're trying to multiply something by 4.5. If that 4.5 is actually a string, like that's what was stuffed in A, it's probably going to throw an error. All right. And then previously, actually, I don't think I ever loaded this. But we were talking before about tables, and I loaded that skyscrapers table that we talked about last time. And so, did I type wrong? No. Might not be finished running. Oh. Oh, I'm running it out of the wrong folder. Oh, I apologize. I didn't drop both files in there. Uh, let me switch real quick. All right, so going back to types, we can say type skyscrapers. And now it should work. And we can see this is that object that we were talking about before, right? The table that has the select and the drop and stuff on it. And so everything has a type. Uh, another one we like to show off here is true. All right. So this is a new type that we haven't talked about yet, but this is called a bool, which is short for Boolean, okay? And Boolean just means true or false, okay? Or zero or one, depending on where you are. Um, but so there's a reserved or a keyword in Python that's called true with a capital T and one called false with a, lower with a capital F. And its type is of Boolean. So if you wanna just store whether something is true or false, that's the value you get. So for example, I can do something like as I can say is two greater than whoop, too many parentheses. And so that's still a Boolean because if I just ask, I should have done that in the same one, but you know, two, one, I will get true, right? Because I asked is two greater than one and I got true, but the type of that is a boolean. So that's where it comes up a lot. And then lastly, uh, let me show you this one first. Or I think we talked about this last time. We talked about abs, right? Or absolute value. So abs of negative four will just give us a four, but the abs itself has a type. So I can do this. And we'll see that it's a built-in function or method, okay? And we'll talk about methods in a bit. <sighs> Any questions? All right, so everything has a type, which can be really handy. And so we talked about a few of them there, um, but 
we have the built-in function or method, which is a weird one, right? But we have ints and tables and floats and stirs. Um, and you can use the type function to get whatever the type is. You can get the type of you know a single thing or a calculation or a name you know, or a variable. Um, and it's based on the value, not on what it looks like. So when I said, you know, if I pass in 4.5 in quotes to type, I will get stir, not float. Okay. Oh, and there's another question. It's funny, it loads up there for you faster than it does for me. All right, so. This is weird. I don't understand why it doesn't like show us the question better. But up in the very top in very small letters, it says, what is the output of type 2.2? <clears throat> And it should be on your phone a little bit more or on whatever you're using top hat, top hat in uh, a little bit more legibly. Oh, I wonder if I did it in Chrome, if it would like better. A lot of apps don't support Firefox very well. All right, let's continue. And it looks like most of you got it correct with float. Um, because it's whatever it was you passed into it, which was in this case, a float. All right, so just to quickly cover conversions in summary, um, you can convert things that look like they should work, right? Um, Sometimes I get annoyed when things I want to work don't work because I want that to work, right? But it does not, right? Um, so remember the computer is stupid. So it can only do relatively simplistic things. It's the building up of all those simplistic things that turn into really interesting software. Uh, any value can be converted to a string at any time and it can give you information about what you're looking at. Um, and you can usually convert a number to other numeric types. However, for example, if you pull an int, if you try to pass a, a float to an int, it will drop the point two. It will not round it. Okay, if this was 0.7, for example, it's not gonna make it two. It's just gonna drop it. It's gonna cut it off, okay? So it will literally just convert the part that is the number to whatever it's supposed, whatever you're asking it to do. All right, so let's talk about arrays. And so does anybody know the word array? Does that ring any bells for anyone? Is that an English word? I don't know. Or is that just a programming word? You can, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, like I said, sometimes I have to think about it to know if it's an English word. So we are actually, if you're familiar with Python at all, this may not be something you're familiar with, but we're gonna use this um, tool called MakeArray to make our array. And so what we do is we give it a name, okay? Which is this height. We're gonna say that's equal to now make this set of things, whatever they are, into an array. And an array is just a list of things. And I forgot to type in the display part, which would be this. And so now we see, again, going back to that type, it indicates to us the type of it. Another common trick with arrays is that if it has square brackets, it usually means it's an array. But then, if I can find my mouse again, we can also do cool things about that, right? We can say heights divided by 12. And now we get a new array where we've divided each of the elements of the array by 12. 
okay, by just passing the array and the division sign and what we want to divide it by. And we can do kind of the reverse as well by doing heights times two. But here's the thing I want to point out again, even though we talked about it before. Anybody know why it's printing out this array? Instead of, remember, I made a mistake and didn't type heights again. Anybody have a theory as to why it's printing it now, but I, it wasn't before? Right, almost in the sense that what happens if I print heights again? What am I going to get to add on to your earlier comment? I'm going to get the original, right? So the reason this is printing is because I'm not modifying heights. I'm just getting a new array. And so it's just printing it out. So what I could do is I could say new heights. And now I get a new variable. Assuming I spelled it right. Oh, I spelled heights wrong the first time. And so now it's actually been assigned. So that's why it didn't print it because I did the assignment operation. But so one of the things to note, right, is that when you're using a name, unless you explicitly reassign it, it's not going to change it. But then we can also do fun, useful things like we want to know how big or how many things there are in there. So we use len, which is short for length. Um, but then we can also do stuff like, let me add them all together. And that will be the total of all the heights. Let me get a couple more of these. And then, but we can also do nicer stuff or a little more sophisticated stuff where we can get the average of the height. Okay, so going back to that toolbox that we mentioned earlier on, um, one of the tools we have in there is we have a big set of tools called NP, which is short for NumPy. And then one of the tools in that toolbox is called average. And so that's why I have to precede it with NP period. Because I say, I want from this toolbox over here, I want this thing called average. Um, and then we can also do, I'm just going to cut and paste this one so it's faster, but we can have arrays of anything, right? It doesn't have to be numbers, but then obviously if we try to do something like this, it's going to be unhappy, right? It's hard to multiply all those strings by two. So it's just going to kind of throw an error and say, this doesn't make any sense, so we're not going to do this. Um, and then lastly, if we want a particular item out of the list, then we can say item. And let's say I want the fourth item. OK, so let me. I think, well, that's not going to work. This will work. So one of the things I want to point out here is this is the number three, but it's giving me the fourth item. Why do you think that is? It counts by zero. So zero, one, two, three. OK? There's a, a, an old bad joke in programming called that goes, um, there are uh, three problems in programming, okay, or three default problems, like problems everybody has. Uh, one is called cache invalidation, which probably won't mean very much to you. And the other one is called off by one errors. All right. And if you think about that for a minute, you'll realize why it's such a not only terrible joke, but completely accurate. You will make this mistake a ton, okay? You have to remember that it starts at zero and it counts from there. Um, however, when you do things like, you know, go over a bunch of things, for example, you might start at one. So you kind of go back and forth between starting at one and starting at zero. And so as a result, making mistakes of being off by one is very, very common, okay? I've been doing this for many, many years now. 
and I still regularly make mistakes about uh, basically the off by one error. Did anybody get my terrible joke? All right, so there's three problems in computer science, cache and validation and off by one errors. All right, so, um, but the item thing kind of works on anything, right? So we can also do it with the strings. Um, and let's say, I can't remember how many I put in there. So I'm just gonna say, oop, I'm not even gonna say that. Hard to type over your shoulder. Um, and so that's going to give us the third item in the list of, of tunas. Um, and then let's just do the recap on arrays. An array contains a sequence of values. The order of that sequence matters. Okay, so it's, it's not just going to get shuffled around on you or whatever, whatever way you put it in or wherever you modify it or whatever. That's the way it's going to remain. So it will stay in that order. Um, arithmetic is applied to each element individually, okay? If it can be, okay? If it's, you know, like I said, if it's strings or whatever, it's going to get wonky, so it's not going to do that. But if you do, if you have numbers in there, then you can um, do arithmetic to it. Um, adding arrays, this is, I think, a little bit uh, confusing. But if you take, uh, you know, if I had heights and then new heights, and I tried to add them together, it's actually going to take the same each of the the corresponding elements and add those together. It's not going to merge the two arrays. Does that make sense? Okay. I think that was weird because strings kind of do the opposite, right? Um, and keep in mind, if you're trying to add two arrays together, they better have the same number of elements. Otherwise, you'll get an error. And then when you're messing with the table, and this should actually be a capital T, so when you're messing with that table, if you ask for a column, what you get back is an array. Okay, so that's why arrays matter to you. You'll you'll kind of min <clears throat> you can then do kind of two nice things, right? You can get an array out of them if you want to uh, do something to it from the table, but you can also add to the table by creating an array. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, not a lot, but we're using this array uh, object primarily because it comes from, uh, it's more used in the data science space, basically, but not a lot. And we actually in like, five, I don't know, 10 lectures from now, I think we actually talk about lists. Uh, lists are, um, a little, are more open-ended than arrays are. All right, uh, let's see. Next slide. Oh, I think there's a question. Nope. Gonna go right into talking about ranges. And as you might imagine, we can make an array like this, but we're lazy, so we don't wanna do that. So instead we can do this which I instantly read this as a range every time, even though it's spelled wrong, spelled wrong. It's a range, okay? So keep that as, the, you know, pretend there's a space in there. So this is create a range or an array starting at zero and going for six elements, okay? So, but the zero is included, so that means it's gonna go from zero to five. Another common, common issue for off by one errors. Um, and, you know, you can obviously do arbitrary sizes. Uh, let's do something relatively reasonable, though. Um, and, you know, it works just as you'd expect. Um, but you can also get somewhat more sophisticated about it by adding other parameters. For example, we can say, actually, let's do this example first. And so what this is saying instead is start at five and go to 11, okay? But the thing to remember, right, it's inclusive on the bottom end and exclusive on the top end. So it's always gonna skip the, the one on the very end um, and include the one at the beginning. 
because it's zero based. Um, but then we can get even more sophisticated by saying, oops. Does anybody have a guess what this is going to do? All right, somebody who doesn't have much Python experience? Any guesses? Do you, you have an answer? Close. What it's going to do is it's going to do the same thing, except it's going to count by two. All right, so instead of counting by one, which is what we were doing before, we're going to get kind of a half the size of an array, right? Depending on where you are in the number line, but you know, approximately half, and it's going to go step by two. Okay, so this number here is usually referred, well, this one's usually referred to as start, and this is normally referred to as end, except it's actually one after the end, right? And then this is usually referred to as a step. Okay, so it's going to go start at zero, step two, step two, add an item until we get to here, and we don't include the 20. So it will always be kind of the step before. So if this was, you know, 37, it's still going to be one step back. How are we doing on time? We're pretty close. Um, but you can also do any size step you kind of want by using, you know, so I can use a decimal step, right? And so obviously I'm going to get decimals, but I can go by 0.1. And so I'm going to get a lot more, right, than I would get from zero to one normally. <laughs> Um, and then the output of that is just an array, just like we were talking about before. Notice the square brackets. So we can also grab arbitrary spots out of it. We can assign it. We can use it like an array in general. Um, so to summarize, and actually, hey, look, I just said this. Um, MPA range, uh, you know, you give, if you give it just one parameter, it's just the end. If you give it two, it's the start and the end. And if you give it three, it's the start and the end and the step. Okay. Um, and like I said, the thing that I have a hard time remembering is that it's going to include the start, but not include the end. All right. Question. All right. I'm going to look up here and see what the actual question is. What integer does your array start with by default? This is another one where I also get messed up because the programming language I started with the default start uh, was not the same as the one in Python. And I will tell you what it is when I'm not giving away the answer, <laughs> which I realized halfway into my sentence. All right, let's call it there. And there's the results. Looks like most of you got it correct. Starts at zero. Um, the other programming language that I started with, which was basic, actually started with one. Uh, so I've always been messed up ever since. So zero is the correct answer. All right, now here is a question for us, which is, what do you think of including the top hat stuff? Um, and there's theoretically no correct answer here, except, you know. <laughs> While you're thinking about that too, um, I also want to make sure, did everybody submit the survey? All right, don't forget about the survey. Uh, it's, I think, posted in Piazza, I want to say. Um, yeah, it's in Piazza. Please do the survey. It's very helpful for us for kind of designing the class um, to make sure, you know, we cover the right stuff. Um, and also, I use the these, you know, quasi fun questions. I use those for data analysis later in the course. 
uh, so that we can show some examples of doing data science with data that's about you. All right, I'm gonna close it there because we are almost over time. Um, looks like pretty positive, which is cool. Uh, and that was my last slide. So uh, just a reminder, I try to put the announcements both at the beginning and end of class in case anybody was late. Um, you know, make sure your attendance is covered. It probably was my top hat, um, but we should be good. <laughs>